As most of us probably know already, Russia has deployed a peacekeeping force to Kazakhstan. There have been over 75 Ilyushin IL-76 planes and over 5 Antonov AN-12 planes that landed in Kazakhstan under the CSTO Rapid Deployment Force. The total number of forces comprise of around 2,500 Russian soldiers, including the 31st Guards Air Assault Brigade, 500 Belarusian soldiers from the SSO 103rd Airborne Brigade, and 100 Armenian soldiers. Anti-Russian opposition media such as Polish headquartered Belarusian media Nechta as well as Ukrainian and Kazakh opposition medias are already calling this an occupation, but in all honesty, how else would the peacekeepers arrive? The reason for such numbers is not only because most government buildings throughout all major cities and throughout the country have been burned, but because there are footages of protester-driven cars ramming through security forces, reports of at least two security forces beheaded, a newly formed Kazakh Liberation Front shows footages of mounted cavalry heading towards cities, and an incident at a foreign exchange military school also claims foreign exchange students being beheaded. While I personally couldn't verify if the beheadings actually occurred or not, the reason for such information being posted is due to the fact that many Kazakh nationals participated with the moderate opposition in Syria against the Syrian Arab army, as well as some footages of Kazakh-speaking individuals allegedly being part of some ISIS units in Iraq a few years ago. And this type of fundamentalist-like mentality even dates back to the Chechen wars where some Kazakh volunteers would go to Chechen on behalf of Al-Qaeda loyalists. So it wouldn't be too far out of reach to suggest that some still maintain such extremist mentalities. Perspective of the Kazakhstan government The violent unrest has spread to nearly all cities of Kazakhstan, to the point where small business owners and store owners are afraid due to major looting still going on. This includes bank ATMs, jewelry stores, electronic stores, and anything else that they can find. Footage on screen now also shows Kazakh security troops surrendering of raiding protesters that captured a security compound, one of several, and looted their stockpile weapons. These weapons were then distributed and footage here shows one security officer being killed by a bullet, the second security officer proning for cover. The Almaty airport has been completely robbed and vandalized, outgoing flights were blocked from liftoff and incoming flights arrived to see the parking lots in flames. Kazakhstan has also claimed that they have arrested over 6,000 protesters, among them foreigners. Which foreigners to be exact, it has not been stated, although opposition media seems to be laughing at that statement. I personally cannot rule out the possibility due to the wildfire-like spread and strategy of the protesters despite the internet and phones still being in a total blackout. The Kazakhstan Supreme Court has also opened 125 criminal cases. A footage on screen now shows alleged vehicles with foreign license plates stopped by the police and found countless weapons ranging from assault rifles to sniper rifles. There are also accounts of armed men prohibiting and blockading fire trucks from coming any closer to burning buildings, purposely preventing them from extinguishing the flames. Many are reported to be speaking in Arabic and footage now shows an alleged protester screaming Allah Akbar. <laughs> The alleged tactic that the so-called foreign protesters use is that they have their commander or leader dress in a bright red jacket which allegedly shows such in multiple locations to be dictating orders and commands. This type of tactic was seen during the Odessa massacre where Ukrainian nationalists would put on a St. George's ribbon to identify themselves as part of anti-Maidan or as they call them, pro-Russians, but would also wear red armbands to distinguish themselves to prevent friendly fire by other Ukrainian nationalists. It is because of these situations that the Kazakh Interior Ministry is now labeling their defense operations as anti-terrorist operations. Meanwhile, on January 9th, Kazakh President Takayev has personally thanked in a public statement the Prime Minister of Armenia, who is currently the head of the CSTO, as well as the President of Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan as well as the presidents of China, Turkey, Uzbekistan, and the United Nations for words of support, with special thanks being given to President Vladimir Putin for a quick, rapid reaction to his request for peacekeepers. In other news, due to the airports in Kazakhstan being closed, the Russian ministry was able to evacuate 200 Russian citizens that were visiting to Kazakhstan for tourism. They were extracted by a government bus and transferred to IL-76 and safely landed back to Russia. 
unconfirmed or false opposition claims. Some opposition media that were active in Euromaidan and Belarus have been spotted making false claims to increase their Russian authoritarianism viewpoint and perspective. Some of them were already reporting civilian casualties by peacekeepers posted hours before the peacekeepers actually landed, but of course, understandably, most subscribers in Eastern Europe and Central Asia won't search the internet to confirm the arrival time and deployment time, and the opposition medias know this. This image here shows, quote, the results of CSTO troops and shows burnt vehicles. However, the burnt vehicle is a Kamaz truck, which would suggest that either the opposition torched it or, based on their claims, the Kazakhs destroyed their own equipment. Which would be silly, but claims such as those are not unheard of, as Ukrainian news during the Donbass war would constantly report how the separatists shot artillery at themselves just for some photographs which are, of course, ridiculous claims. Unconfirmed or false government claims. Although these aren't official claims, Kazakh government officials firmly believe in international destabilization tactics and funding. One such claim is that the Soros Foundation has funded over $100 million to the opposition, which as of this moment cannot be proved or disproved, but has been confirmed through public financial reports that I have personally reviewed that the Soros Foundation has funded the Euromaidan coup and its so-called freedom medias. Other Kazakh government experts claim that there were foreign training camps teaching and advising the strategy and tactics of the opposition. As of this moment, it's not possible to confirm and verify this, but claims of foreigners include to be Islamic fighter veterans and Ukrainian nationalists, with the evidence they use as a route used from Afghanistan to enter Kazakhstan as well as knowing exactly where to strike, how to defend from attacks, and how to expertly distribute weapons. Prior to this unrest, there have been a few counter-terrorist operations, which is nothing unusual as counter-terror ops are common throughout southern Russia and Central Asia, which is why the government has not paid attention to find a link between the new Kazakh nationalism that's sweeping the nation and Islamic terrorists. Footage now includes a promised caliphate to the Kazakhstani lands. And last but not least, the firm claim and believe that Western mass media are underplaying the intensity of quote, peaceful protesters and overplaying the brutality of Kazakh security forces. To which Kazakhstani government experts responded with, what would your country do if its entirety was on fire? This they claim is part of an intense misinformation campaign. Final news. As I'm editing this video, some rumors have surfaced of rioters taking over an ex-Soviet chemical facility which allegedly have found evidence of Kazakhstan working on biological weapons. This may or may not be a false information campaign to justify other military interventions or sanctions against Kazakhstan, which were similarly done to Iraq and Syria and other countries for justification of destabilization reasons. It would seem that on the contrary, there is a US chemical plant still being constructed with intense secrecy in Kazakhstan that seems to have worried Russia since the early 2021, but this topic is to be discussed in the next upcoming video. Also in Geneva, the US and Russian presidents Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin respectively have met for talks, also to be summarized in the next video. Conclusion all in all, the country is in total chaos, and whether security forces being approved to use firearms and are weapons free is debatable, it is hard to argue against a peacekeeping force. For comparison, January 6th of last year, 2021, the incident that occurred on Capitol Hill saw massive arrested of individuals that didn't even storm the White House but were simply near it and still had criminal charges put against them and are doing time for it right now in prison. So one can only speculate how hard democratic governments would respond to such a crisis, but as a person living in New York City, I can totally imagine the NYPD turning hostile against its own citizens, as it already views most of its citizens as criminals and looks to arrest as many people for as many charges as possible. At the same time, however, using live ammunition against crowds of rioters will only serve to prove the claims of any false opposition media stories and end up confirming the corruption and brutality of the government that's playing the defense.
defensive role. So in the end, this is a very delicate situation that one can always suggest to do this instead of that with hindsight to their advantage. I will be continuing to bring the news as they develop. In the meantime, check out our Discord server to get engaged in conversation about this, and I'll see you all in the next one.